So our speaker today is Lindsay Pasho, the Agricultural Business Management and Marketing Specialist for the Harvest New York program, which is based out of the Franklin County Cooperative Extension Office. Lindsay received her bachelor's degree in business marketing and master's in administration and leadership from SUNY Plattsburgh. Lindsay also owns Adirondack View Vineyard in Keysville, New York. So without further ado, welcome, Lindsay. Hi. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna be talking about starting a winery in Northern New York, um, winery establishment consideration and cost. So this project um, actually was put together from myself and Miguel Gomez, who's in Cornell um, University's Dyson School of Business. And um, with, his, with help from Ryan Graff, he was a summer intern this last summer from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. So how this project got started. Back in 2016, I was visiting a bunch of wineries in Northern New York and noticed that information regarding um, winery establishment costs and considerations were, was not available um, for the wineries. So in 2017, uh, my summer intern Ryan Graft and I visited 14 current and future wineries being established across Northern New York. And we talked about establishment issues and equipment. Some of the things to consider are there's no secret in establishing a winery. It's a significant investment for everyone. It's important to understand the costs and potential return of investment. It is important to do your research of the existing wineries in your area and to understand that it's not a competition among wineries, that you're actually working together to create a wine industry or strengthen an existing industry. Remember that customers are all different. They enjoy sweet, dry, red and white wines. You wanna encourage customers to try other wines and if you have, uh, for example, a dry red wine, uh, red wine, but your customer actually wants a sweet white, maybe try to encourage your uh, customers to visit your neighbor. So what my summer intern and I did was uh, we created a report that hits across uh, some winery establishment consideration and costs. This includes looking at the state of New York wine industry, looking at uh, Northern New York wine sales and markets, equipment to consider, cost calculation tools, licensing in New York State, growing grapes versus purchasing grapes um, and juice, what you need to consider for a winery building and potential financial help. So the state of New York wine industry. New York State has uh, established uh, 10 American viticultural areas. An American viticulture area, AVA, is a designated grape growing area with significant geographical boundaries that have been approved by U.S. Department of Treasury, Alcohol and Tobacco, Tax and Trade Bureau, the TTB. The AVA allows wineries to label their wine with their areas AVA um, if they have 85% of grapes um, in the grapes of the bottle. Uh, that come from this particular AVA region. An AVA provides recognition to the grapes growing in the particular area and the environmental conditions um, bring out characteristics to the to grape that are unique from any other area of the world. The 10 existing American viticulture areas are uh, Long Island, the Hamptons, North Forks of Long Island, the Champlain Valley of New York, the Hudson River region, Finger Lakes, the Seneca Lakes, Cayuga Lakes, Niagara, and Lake Erie. This is important for us to just understand what the actual entire region of New York State was overall. Then we looked at Northern New York wine sales and markets. So when we were visiting these 14 current and future wineries, we really wanted to figure out what the actual establishment issues were and what the actual current sales were. So currently sales in New York, uh, Northern New York are consistent of retail and wholesale. Um, not a lot of these wineries are using distributor. It's very uncommon for them to. Uh, this is due to like small batches and the associated cost of dealing with a distributor. 
Sales were currently mainly done in New York State um, due to the fact that if you decide to sell out of state, it's requiring you to uh, apply for separate licensing for each of the 50 states, or just if you want to sell to one uh, state in particular. The wineries that we talked to were, when they first started to get established, were looking at around six um, six wines that they would have on their shelf that consist of like sweet or dry, red or white. And over time they expanded to about 15, um, some up to like 25. And not all of the wines on their shelf were, were made with grapes. They also consist of many fruit wines, such as blueberry, elderberry, uh, strawberry, apple, peach, watermelon, anything you can probably think of when it gets down to it. We also looked at what the what wineries were doing in northern New York. Um, were they just looking at selling in their tasting room or what, what are other activities they were doing? And the majority of them were actually holding a variety of events, including weddings, live music, food festivals, paint and sips, yoga and wine. And this was due because of um, a lot of them are working to attract tourists, but also to bring back um, local business uh, weekly, just so that you know your locals weren't coming to your tasting room one time and not actually coming back to your tasting room again. They would come weekly for a drink a glass of wine and do yoga or drink a glass of wine and, and paint. We also looked at in, in Northern New York at what some of the different type of other marketing options were. And this included um, there are three existing current wine trails that help wineries promote um, their wineries with signage and collective marketing. Their Chamber of Commerce was very involved with these wine trails um, with doing the marketing behind them. And some of them had yearly events, including tastings and such as other parts of New York State, they even had uh, tasting events during like the holidays um, with a theme behind them. And in Northern New York, the three existing wine trails are the Adirondack Coast Wine Trail, the St. Lawrence Wine Trail, and the Thousand Islands Seaway Wine Trail. When we were talking to many of these wineries, um, most had actually purchased used equipment in the beginning. They had some pros and cons behind it. The pros was that it did not have to buy this equipment at full price, but the con behind them was they were sometimes worse than if you get wear and tear on the equipment or you just didn't know what that wear and tear were, had been in the past. But a lot of these wineries instead, what they bought small and then they slowly expanded into newer equipment over time or just larger equipment based on how big their winery So right here is a list of some of the equipment to consider, but not all equipment. There's actually going to be, there's more equipment that we have listed on the Harvest New York website, which has this actual report of all the information that I'm kind of talking about, plus an interactive spreadsheet with a list of equipment um, in various sizes. Consider buying, um, starting out small and purchasing larger over time is one of the things that the current wineries in Northern New York was, um, was telling people considering getting to the, to the business. So we have different areas that we've uh, broken the winery down into receiving. Um, so your scale to determine um, how, many, how much your grapes weigh, pallet jacks and hand cart to move heavy equipment around, crush or destemmer, crush the grapes to remove stems to create the must. A press, um, press to press out um, the moss into juice, fermentation tanks um, to ferment the juice into wine, glass carboys, a container for wine storage and aging. This was done on very small wineries we're using this. Um, very, very small just starting. Um, most people that are actually getting to the business really were moving right into the stainless steel um, tanks for fermenting. So glass carboys is probably not something that a very um, small winery is really going to end up doing in the long run. Uh, 
tri uh, clamps and tasting valves, our addition to stainless steel tanks, uh, oak barrels for wine storage and aging, white um, oak alternatives. These are like chips, cubes, sticks that are made of oak. Um, they're alternative to um, oak barrels. Plastic tanks, alternatives for stainless steel um, fermentation tanks. And then in the cellar part, we have must pumps, helps to move must from crusher destemmer into tanker press. Transfer pump, um, transfers the wines to help with the racking process. Hoses, um, used with a must and transfer pump to move uh, product the size and in length vary um, depend depending on your transfer transferring and transfer lengths and then for lab equipment kind of just a refractometer a wine thief for testing on the wine so2 ph and ta testers um, to test the different levels filtration systems and then you've got your bottles your corks um, you heat capsule shrinker, uh, label, labeler, and corks and capsules. And then we have um, the next thing that was part of this report was a cost calculating tools, which you can actually find this on harvest um, harvestny.cce.cornell.edu. And this is where you'll find the report in an actual um, interactive Excel, Excel spreadsheet. I'm gonna kind of show you kind of this tool that we've got. So in the Excel spreadsheet, there are three different fields. As you can see at the bottom, there is an orange arrow. There's a yield per vine. Um, it's a tank calculation tool, a yield per acre, and a production establishment cost. So right now we're in the yield per vine. And you can see if you look across the top, um, you've got grape variety and average yields and number of vines. These can all be changed based on what your vineyard is. So what uh, particular grape vines that you might have. You might have Frontenac and Marquette. Um, these aren't listed right in the middle, but you can change these and delete the ones that you're not using. There's an average yields of, of 10 pounds per vine that have been set for right now. Um, what is actually advised to do is to actually track what your average yield is in your vineyard um, every single season. And then you can actually do it by the number of vines. You'll see down below there's actual yield per acre. This is actually so that you can actually do um, your average yield per vine and, and there's number of acreage in the next tablet on the bottom, just in case um, we did it this way, just so that if you had a very small planting, you're able to kind of figure out this. The fields that you can change are your potential yield, your total gallons, and your total bottles. And so what I've done is I've gone ahead and changed uh, around the names and the average yields in this next slide number of vines, and then you'll see that it actually, um, there's, it's already been formulated to actually pop out your potential yields and pounds, your total gallons that you might have, that you'll have, and your, your total bottles that you would need. And then on the next slide, you'll move into, when you look at your gallons on the last slide, you can go right to your tank size and you can put down exactly how many tanks that you'll need. Those um, tank size are all able to change to know exactly how many gallons that you've got. You'll notice in the last section, there's a, another red arrow. And this is the balance of gallons that you've got from those existing tank size sizes. You're not able to change those, the balance of gallons that have been um, figured out for you. But if you have enough space in your tank, it would turn into a negative. So you're, 
the one that has the star is, says 31, so that's technically not enough room for, um, for the amount of juice that you've got. So you'd have to um, go back in the Excel spreadsheet and add in um, more tank sites. One thing to consider is, as you can see, I've got a 79 ga two 79 gallons, uh, 158 gallons, 172 gallons. It's, they're all kind of over the place. What you wanna consider is making sure that you you pick equipment that is something that you're going to be continuous use, not just based on what this comes out as. So if you're going to kind of stick into a, a size of gallon tanks that you're going to be using on a daily basis, and you're going to want to have um, at least one extra tank free so that you're racking off your wine. And at the bottom of the Excel spreadsheet, where the green arrows are, you'll see your total cases of wine that, uh, that will toll cases that you would need, the number of tanks you need per variety, and then your, um, your total bottles. Total bottles will also, that, that 18,600 would be your capsules um, and also your number of corks that you would need. And so this is the the same type of spreadsheet, but this one is yield per acre. And then when you jump into the production establishment costs, and they've kind of been, we've made it so that you can look at your receiving, all you can put, find out, put in your receiving equipment that you might need. So how we did this is all the equipment in the spreadsheet is an average from at least three or four uh, websites that the majority of the wineries in northern New York were using. So those are that's what gave us our estimated cost and this is kind of a lot of the equipment that the existing wineries in northern New York were using or expanding to. So you'll be able to jump in in the Excel spreadsheet and put down um, your estimated units that green arrow are exactly what you would need and so you can look at is your receiving equipment, and it's it's just not one um, like bladder press. You'll see that there's a number of different sizes, so you can actually see which ones, what size would better fit your operation. Then we move down to fermentation tanks. Um, these are just kind of the highlight areas. There's a lot more uh, on the actual Excel spreadsheet. Uh, cellar equipment different filtration systems for your bottling, um, your lab equipment, your basic um, chemicals that are used in a winery. You might have some different ones that you might be using that you'll, um, you, you'll be able to change in the Excel spreadsheet. And then additional cost. Uh, we didn't put estimated costs down for that, but you can actually change that in the, this Excel spreadsheet. And at the end of um, the Excel spreadsheet, there's you can add whatever additional equipment you might have. And then it filters out at the bottom. It'll give you your total cost for each of those different areas. It breaks down. Do we have any questions so far? Hey, everyone. Sorry, I should have given you a little bit uh, earlier warning that the break was coming. But um, please feel free to post your questions. Give it just a minute, Lindsay, and see if we get anything. Okay. Did you have any um, connection errors at all? Sorry? Did Was there any connection errors with the internet? No, nope, it's working okay. great for me. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so, Lindsay, I have a question for you. Um, okay. Have, have you done any of this? Do uh, you have an overall estimate of all the costs, uh, just given some assumptions about how much are you going to go through that in the, in, in the rest of the talk? Um, it's probably best for people to kind of jump onto that website and do this um, yeah. on their own. I'm happy to, to do this with anybody, but everybody's operation that we saw in Northern New York was very different. I mean, you had okay. some operations that already had existing um, buildings, um, so they didn't have to, to worry about putting up, you know, 
a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollar building when it got down to it. Um, some people had very minimal cost starting, but the biggest, um, you know, the, one of the biggest expenses all that equipment. And yeah. when I did have run the numbers just on the equipment side, sometimes it adds up to like sixty-seven thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars just on the equipment size. Yeah. It, it it all depends on how small. I mean, one of the reasons why I said, you know, I did put uh, glass carboys down there is we did go to, into um, some wineries that did have glass carboys. The big struggle that they found was they did not have enough room. And, you know, one operation had just glass carboys and they, yeah. they were struggling on space wise. So it's, it's a way to start out. And, you know, especially since this is a big investment, you know, is is this going to work out for you or not it's it's something to consider as if you can do it minimal starting up that's would be ideal but it is a big investment okay. i actually have a question lindsay um what's your opinion if you have one on variable capacity tanks for people starting out um, i know they can be a bit finicky and the lids can fall in but is that a good way for someone who's starting smaller um, and wants to grow later, but not buy a big tank right away to go? Or do you, do you have opinions on that? Um, I think, I think what people should do is probably really to spend some time with market, look at, look at existing wineries and figure out what's kind of working the best for them overall. Um, I don't want to say yes or no either way but i think maybe talking to other people um you know we have a bunch of different events that are coming up um we've got bev there's the eastern wine symposium where people can to to go to different trade shows and talk to these um people that are selling the equipment and kind of get an idea of what's going to work best for them overall okay um so we actually also have a question from louise mcdonald and she says how big were the vineyards that were trying to use glass carboys? How many plants? I guess um, they, let me see how big they were. They were buying, um, they were buying from, um, they were buying off of somebody who had like an acre and a half of vines. Um, that was probably about 700 vines. Okay. So small. very small, yeah. yeah. Um, and then we have another question about uh, what is the average size average for winery that can be managed with no helpers? Mm. Would that be a, is it a winery or a vineyard? Uh, let's see. Can you specify, Sylvian, if you're talking about a winery or a vineyard or both? Um, and then. Well, we're waiting on that. Stephen Kinosh wants to know if you have an opinion on plastic tanks. Um, sometimes the, the issue with the plastic tanks is the quality of the wine. The, you, the, ideally, in a plastic tank, you wouldn't want to store, them, store wine over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, but if that's, if you know, if you want to use plastic tanks, that is an option and stuff. You just wouldn't want to, that's not an the ideal place to be aging wine. Gotcha. Okay, and then back to Sylvian's question, he wants to know about both um, winery and vineyard. Tim, what's, uh, what's your input on that, on the vineyard side? Tim is muted at the moment, so while we wait for him to come back to us, um, I can say, oh, you hear Tim? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but go ahead, Raquel, if you want to tackle yeah, this. Yeah, so um, I used to be the manager of a small five-acre vineyard, um, and given I was only working on the vineyard side, but with a little bit of help, I was able to keep that under control as a pretty much one-woman show. So I don't know if that answers your question, Sylvan, on the vineyard size without a helper. <laughs> But that's my personal experience. I guess this raises a question I, I have for you, Lindsay, is uh, so you've talked about equipment so far, but uh, uh, did you include other things about the building and the, you know, the capital costs involved in the bin building and vineyard or is there other places to put that in your spreadsheet? 
Um, there's information to put that in this in that spreadsheet. All the the remaining stuff is kind of things of considerations. Um, yeah, the remaining parts considerations. Yeah. I think one of the things is too across northern New York is um, there weren't very many people that were doing this as a full time job. Okay. It was a lot of people that were doing it um, as a retirement or um, in conjunction with another job too. So that's one thing to consider is how much time you're going to have to spend in a, a vineyard in a tasting room. Yeah. Okay, so I, I have no opinion about how many employees are needed for what size uh, winery. Um, you know, and I, I do know for a vineyard, yeah, I think, you know, if you get up to five acres and you have the right equipment, uh, you can probably manage that with one person. Uh, beyond that, it starts to get uh, iffy and, and, uh, um, and, my my feeling is that you know uh, with some temporary labor if that's available for pruning and so forth yeah a person a single person could probably manage you know up to 20 or 30 acres of vineyard um with supplemental labor but um i'm going to stop there before i get into trouble <laughs> okay and um so Drew's made a good comment about plastic tanks and sanitation in the comments uh, for those of you who were curious. And I think our questions have slowed, so yeah. I guess we can continue. There was another comment by Drew uh, Horton, uh, sort of an invitation to discuss specifics of equipment size capacities and so forth. Uh, and Drew is the uh, uh, enologist at uh, the University of Minnesota, so probably a good, good resource resource for that. And uh, we did post the uh, URLs in several places for both the general site and then the link to the spreadsheet. So those are in the chat bar. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Drew, uh, I'll I'll repost Drew's comment to everybody. Okay. Oh yeah, see, sorry. Um, some of you are not sending to all panelists and attendees. You're just sending to all panelists. So please make sure that you have it on both so that everyone can see what you're saying. Okay. Okay, so I'll jump into the licensing information. Um, so New York State currently has three different licensings. Um, there's the farm winery license, which authorizes license to annually manufacture and wholesale up to 250,000 gallons of wine and or cider made exclusively from New York State grown agricultural products, um, must be located on a farm. And then a micro farm winery, which is authorizes licensees to annually manufacture and wholesale up to 1,500 gallons of wine and or cider made exclusively from New York State grown agricultural products and that one must be located on a farm. And then there's the uh, winery, special winery, which is authorizes licensees to manufacture and wholesale wine. So kind of just an overall of the licensing process in New York State um, and the federal government is it, on average, with the wineries in Northern New York, it took them anywhere from six months to two years to get their license, but the average was around a year. Uh, basically, the process is um, you would apply for your fe through the federal government, the Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau for your online permit. And as of uh, November 30th, 2016, it was about 163 days to get your online permit. And then you apply for your state licensing. It's, it's not ideal to apply for them both at the same time because of the length that the federal government licensing process takes. So you wanna apply for your federal licensing first, um, wait a little bit, and then apply for your New York state licensing uh, because you will need um, your federal online, your permit number for your New York State licensing. 
Um, in your state, we have Empire State Development, One Stop Shop, which is a resource if you need help with applying for your license um, and regulation que um, questions. So things to consider, uh, what's in a, a, a what's in a bottle of a wine? So you, everybody knows we've got your, your body, your cork, and your labor. Um, and your label. But some of the things to consider are your, your labor, your, including your vineyard, your processing and your winery, your cost of your grapes and juice, your total operation, your building your equipment, liability insurance, property taxes, and more. So you look at that overall, your bottle of wine is kind of expensive. So it's important to do kind of uh, your actual marketing research, especially of your area. So let's face it, um, when it gets down to it, people can go to a liquor store and buy um, wine for $5 a bottle, around $20 for a box of wine. So you've, what makes your wine and your operation different? And how much, are willing be, or how much are people willing to pay? Are you uh, focusing on local customers or people from outside your area? So these are some kind of considerations um, in kind of figuring out how much you're going to to price out your bottle of wine. I think the average in Northern New York was around about $12 a bottle. So should you grow grapes versus uh, purchase grapes and juice? So this, um, this information, this table was um, referenced from where you can be um, we found online it's a cost of establishment of a vineyard in a Lake Erie area and there's also one for cost of establishment and the production of cold climate grapes in the Thousand Islands and when we look at when we look at overall uh, the the cost of um, growing these grapes. If we look at Brianna from Northern New York, the total sales price um, when people sold these even back to their own vineyard was $3,660 versus in the Lake Erie region, it was about $3,000. Um, we can see what the variable costs on the Brianna, the fixed cost, and then the profit and loss. One of the things to look at is the Lake Erie region um, is a big Concord area. They're very well established. They already had existing equipment um, and they just decided to, to, to grow some cold climate grapes. While the Thousand Islands area um, is very new, people had to purchase um, equipment. So, also looking at this, the variable costs that were in consideration were um, site preparations, the pre-harvest and the harvest and labor. The fixed um, cost was the machinery, equipment depreciation, building depreciation, property taxes, insurance, and land costs were just some of, some of the things that were put in to what the overall variable and fixed costs were. So, you know, you spend, you need to consider, do you want to be growing grapes? Do you want to be growing grapes, making wine, and running a winery? Maybe have a few grapes um, for the overall looks of your winery. But um, th it's definitely important to consider, you know, the amount of time that you're putting into growing grapes into your winery. Um, it, you do find out from the study that just growing grapes and selling them on, like, especially on a very small scale, is you're not really making any type of profit on it unless you, you you jump the next step and do the value added of making your wine. And then we looked at um, what was in the, the winery buildings. Um, a lot of these wineries in northern New York were actually renovating different buildings on their property, either garages, um, barns, expanding off um, their own homes, just making sure that there's a separate, separate area. So things to consider with um, building a, 
building a winery is, will the building be strictly to produce wine in? Will the building be used for wine production and offer wine tastings? Will the building used to produce wine in offer wine tastings and be a venue location? How large should the facility be? Uh, most of the wineries in, in Northern New York that had been existing for several years were having issues with capacity. So they were, um, they were at capacity and they needed to expand or they already had were expanding. So how will you expand with your building down the road? Um, if the winery does not work out as a viable business, um, what's what's going to be your backup? Um, one winery I talked to in particular basically has the, their winery set up that if it didn't work out in the long run, they just have to basically put up three different walls and they could turn it into a, a house for, for a rental. Um, what do I need for building permits? This includes like local permits. Um, if you're in like a, a park, um, such as where, where I'm located, we're in the Adirondack Park. Um, so put, consider if you need different permits, these may take a while to obtain. Be aware that if you apply for your permit ahead of time and the project is not completed with an existing permit, you may need to expand on your permit time. What is gonna be your total occupancy of the building? What are the codes for a building? Um, you'll wanna contact your local enforcement office. And when will the uh, renovation building be completed? Uh, make sure that you have realistic goals with opening your winery. Leave an allowance for building and renovation delays because that tends to happen. And there, what are some potential financial um, help that are available out there? I get probably a phone call at least once a week asking for, um, I've heard that starting a winery, brewery, harsidery, distillery, that there's free money available out there. Um, it's kind of a common misconception, but there's no really free money out there. Um, it's basically in forms of loans and grants. Uh, so I'm gonna go down the list of, um, so the United States Department of Agriculture tends to have um, a couple grants every year out there. Um, this last one that a lot of vineyards in my area are applying for were those of value added. A uh, farm service agency can provide um, loans and crop insurance. Your local industrial agents, a development agency um, usually has uh, low interest loans for people getting starting with business. Farm Credit East um, is a loan loaning agency. Same thing as Yankee Farm Credit. Now you consider talking to your local banks. Um, some banks won't um, offer funding towards, I'm sorry. <coughs> no. Won't offer um, funding towards um, agriculture. Um, and in New York State, there are uh, regional economic development councils. Um, in the North Country, we have the North Country Regional Economic Development Councils, which offers um, a certain amount of funding matching. And then there's Empire State Development in New York State. So you kind of want to do your research in your area of local and statewide um, funding and federal loans on um, the grants that are available. Uh, remember that some of these loans and grants that you'll sometimes have to upfront the cost and then they'll re, um, return, um, they'll pay you back on the amount that they um, have told you that they would provide in the long run. Um, some additional considerations. Um, is the market flooded with too many wineries or is developing into becoming a wine destination such as the Finger Lakes, California, France, and Australia? Do more wineries in a region necessarily equal more people visiting them? Um, how much of investment am I willing to prepare to make in a winery? What types of market do I see for my winery uh, 
Are you retail sales, wholesale, um, farmer's market, weddings, agritourism? Is my winery in a, a location that gets regular traffic? Um, if not, how will I work at my winery to become a destination winery that people will search out to visit? Um, and then I'd just like to thank all the wineries for generously opening their doors to, to um, allow this project to occur. And the report and spreadsheet can be found on Harvest New York's website. And if you have any questions, well, any questions um, that I don't answer today, you can always just email me at lep67 at cornell.edu. Thank you, Lindsay. That was awesome. Um, so we just want to thank our sponsors that have helped to make this possible and are going to continue to help us this spring. Um, and then, sorry, Lindsay, if you could just click next onto the last slide for me, that would be great. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so we just wanted to let you all know, because uh, this is probably of interest to you as well, uh, we have a new project and associated webinar series coming for the Vitus Gen project. Um, so this is looking at breeding new great varieties um, that have disease resistance. Um, so I'm sure that many of you might be interested in this. And so our webinar series for that will start up soon. At the moment, you can follow us on Twitter. Um, and if you'd like to get on the mailing list for that project, uh, just send me an email, rfk58 at cornell.edu, and I will add you to that. Um, and so I think we have time for more questions, right, Tim? Yeah, uh, and I'd like to jump in here for a minute and uh, also thank Lindsay for uh, for making this tool. It's always good to have uh, tools that you can uh, estimate costs and, and sort of work through. And so I, I think this is a really valuable thing for the industry and, and certainly value, valuable beyond New York, even if some of the licensing things are very specific to New York. Um, one of the things I did want to mention is that I put in links to the two uh, cost of establishment bulletins for cold hardy grapes that we put in uh, that Lindsay alluded to in the slide, uh, um, which, um, which one of them was from the uh, Chautauqua region, which was the person that had 200 acres of uh, Concord grapes or bulk, bulk hybrids. And, you know, the cost of establishment was about putting in 13 or 15 acres of cold hardy grapes in addition to the 200 acres. Uh, and then the Thousand Island one, that was based on a 22 acre uh, vineyard, but just uh, with all the uh, equipment and startup costs uh, basically piled into those 22, uh, 22 acres of vineyards and a little bit different yield uh, assumptions for the two, which really affected uh, the cost figures that, that Lindsay showed. Basically, if you can sped, spread your development costs over a lot more acres, it, uh, it really lowers your, your fixed costs per acre for, for having the grapes. And, uh, and the other point I wanna make is that the, you know, the yield matters uh, in those bulletins. Uh, we were estimating a couple tons per acre for uh, I believe Marquette. And even with a high uh, per, per ton price of uh, $1,500 a ton, um, um, you know, the, it, it'd be great to get that tonnage up, uh, that 10 pounds per vine uh, thing that Lindsay put in. Uh, if we use six by nine vine, vine spacing, that amounts to about four tons per acre. And my personal opinion about what people should be shooting for, uh, for uh, wine production is uh, sort of in that three to four ton per acre uh, range. So I'm gonna shut up now. Uh, but thanks, thanks, Lindsay, uh, for uh, for your efforts here. Okay, uh, other questions? Um, right and just to let everybody know, we're going to be sending out a comments email so for feedback. So if you could fill that out with any feedback you might have, it would be really helpful. It should come tomorrow. So thanks for joining us. Okay, and our next one will be? March 13th, uh, that's cultural practices to help you uh, overcome winter injury.
Yes, and that will be with Paolo Sabatini and Thomas Todaro, both of Michigan State. So I, I have the feeling that many people who started growing grapes, you know, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you might be due for replacing cordons or doing some serious trunk renewal. So I hope this uh, next webinar will, will address uh, that topic for you. Uh, so thank you all for attending. Appreciate it.